Welcome back to Pastor Plex Podcast. I am so glad that all of you are joining us. We're recording live right now on whatever platform you're watching. We are presenting, and we're super excited that you are joining us for a little Exodus 19 sermon recap. And with me in studio is none other than Mrs. Katie Sass, a.k.a. Ava's mom. How are you? Doing great. <laughs> and then also, ba- from back in the day, we have our very first church planner, Holland Gregg, joining us from the east side. Welcome, Holland. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Happy to be here. That is definitely Holland in a nutshell. <laughs> How did you get in this nutshell? All right, here we go. But I wanted to talk about just a recap of Exodus 19, which I'm pretty pumped about because it has so much... Um, I think contextual, salvific understanding for us modern day Christians as it's like the, a great visual of how salvation works. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, but the big premise that we really wanted to sort of have everyone wrap their mind around was this idea of being set apart. Now, Katie, have you ever been set apart for anything? What wondering. does that even mean? <laughs> Have you ever been thought of as a distinct person? Have you been in a part of a distinct club? Anything that would make you different from the average person? Well, in college, I started the Art Institute's very first fashion club. Oh. And I was voted president. <laughs> so. Thank you. That's huge. <laughs> no, I do remember these days. Uh, Holland, do you remember those days? I, I mean, those were those That's when early y'all days me. of Wells that's, Branch. Yeah. That's when y'all Katie. used to like, give me food to get me to come to things. That's right. We did. We did, gave you a lot of food to come to things. So how are you set apart? Well, talk to me about uh, as the fashion club of, <laughs> of the Art Institute. <laughs> Sorry. Is that club still going today, by the way? No. uh, (laughs) When I left, it ended. Yeah, I understand how that goes. (laughs) It was great. But but how were you set apart? How how did you decide or how were you set apart as the fashion club girl? Oh, I just tried to dress better than everyone. (laughs) So. (laughs) Which was that hard? No. No. And no. not for you, because you are, I mean, look at you right now. The earrings are really working for you. you I love the hair. It's You have a great I look I only going. look like this because you changed the time, and that meant less time for me to work out. And so I was like, well, fine. I guess I just won't work out, and I'll just spend 30 minutes getting ready. Oh, well, we should be very honored by that. <laughs> uh, and we are, of course. So, <laughs> so yeah. Holland, what about you? What, in what way have you ever been set apart, if there's anything you can think of? Like fraternity, were you in, at A and M? Uh, were you a fraternity person? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing, Katie? What do you, you got something to say? <laughs> What's going on with that? Calling in a fraternity. <laughs> what is, wait, why? What? Why that statement? He, he couldn't. He can't see Holland in a like. You just don't see him. Like, no, he's not a frat dude. <laughs> mm. I'm not. It's true. I was in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what happened in college? Uh, I was in an elite dodgeball team. Um, the Look Burninators, we winning. were champions my freshman, sophomore year. Um, so we were set apart in that way of being, <laughs> you know, uh, excelling athletically in a challenging <laughs> sport like dodgeball. And yeah. All right. Well, okay. Uh, there are others of us that were set apart by being in the military, which is an exciting thing. You had a different uniform, different language, different haircut. Uh, and that's kind of how I experienced being set apart. Uh, and what, God is doing with Israel in Exodus 19 is he's reminding them how they are a distinguished nation set apart for his purposes as predestined really in the Abrahamic covenant. And then he he has a a couple sayings here, which I just really want to read off for us, which I just thought was so great. He says, you yourselves, this God uh, speaking uh, through Moses, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that term holy nation is means set apart or distinct. And I think sometimes when we hear the word holy, we think, what do we think? We think perfect, maybe. But holy is, although it is like righteous in, in many ways, but it's a set apart for a particular use, in this in this case, very sacred. So I thought that was just a, a powerful thing, that God had plans for Israel. 
And so therefore, this entire thing of <clears throat> bringing all Israel up to Mount Sinai was to help them understand how distinct they were, and they're about to be given the law, which would set them apart from all other nations as a way that they conducted themselves in a very honorable way that honored God and each other. So the only thing I remember about your sermon is the gun, the, the, the water pellet story, the gun story. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that part. Which was all about God wanting to spend time with us. Yes, because that, because he is, that's the blessing part. You shall be my treasured possession. I, I'm glad you heard something. That's good. Katie always keeps, as a preacher, having Katie around keeps you right on humble. I'm not like intentionally <laughs> trying to criticize No, you. I appreciate that. I'm just that. saying no, it's good. that was like one of the big things that I got from okay. and your <clears throat> sermon. So now you talking about this, I'm like, wait, what, what did, did that story so, have to yeah, do with? So remember, so Austin's my son. And he, so to explain that story, because <laughs> if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. All right. So here we go. So, <laughs> so what happened was, see, what ha- happened was uh, my, my son, who is a part of my family, he didn't choose to be part of my family. I chose him, in a sense, uh, with Adrian. We chose to have him. And then uh, part of it is like, hey, if you obey me, you are going to receive a blessing, and mm-hmm. you shall be my treasure possession. And right. so uh, we, were given, we were given these uh, gel blasters. Are you familiar with gel blasters? Of course. Of course he is. <laughs> uh, do you know what gel blasters are? No. You have a daughter. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so gel blasters are, like, better than squirt guns and better than BB guns because they, sh- they hit like BB guns, but they don't r- leave a mark. They sting. They sting. They sting they yeah. yeah, and they're not like paint guns. that are paintball guns that, you know, are messy. And so, anyway, it's super great. So we have all these gel blasters, uh, four of them, and three of them work. And of course, my oldest son, his doesn't work. And so I was like, hey, why? And he's like, I want to take it apart and figure it out. I was like, hey, why don't we take it apart? Let's you, you know, do some YouTubing, and let's take it apart, see if we can figure out what's messed up with it, and then we'll try and put it back together. Well, if you know anything about gel blasters, lots of teeny little parts, and you start unscrewing things, and this, there's screws all over the place, and then there's springs all over the place. And I was like, oh, man, we'll never get this thing back together. But with enough YouTube instruction, we've after several hours of work and very much uh, having to calm ourselves down at the anger and frustration at pieces <laughs> of plastic and springs, uh, we finally got it back together, and it still didn't work. And, uh, <laughs> of course, right. Uh, it turns out we, I think we need a new lithium battery anyway. But uh, after that, about 30 minutes after that, Austin walked up to me. He's like, Hey dad, Hey, thanks for doing that with me. Mm. And I was like, who are you? You know, it was like, a, I mean, like <laughs> who thanks their dad for spending time with them? And I was really grateful for that. And that's what it means to be a treasured possession. So he's adopted, he's, he's saved or a part of the family. He is, he obeyed my will. And then I treasured him and he felt that and his response was to love me back. And so yeah. that sort of was like the picture of how, like, and he does it way better than me. He, he's a way better kid than I was at that age. I've been like, gosh, how come this thing doesn't work? You stink. You know, like I, I might've gone that route <laughs> right. and, he, and he, he didn't do that, which I was really grateful for. Uh, but we love God because he first loved us. And sometimes, and I think here's, if you focus on the gel blaster and not on the intimacy with God, you don't realize the blessing you've gotten right. to spend time yeah. with him. The blessing isn't the gel blaster. The blessing is the time spent with the Lord. And I think as Christians, and, and I think this is where I, I think I made the case of my Israeli friend who said, <laughs> this culture is, and he was, like I said, he was trying to be very nice. He's like, um, your culture is very different. It's uh, it's all based on entertainment. And I was like, <laughs> whatever do you mean? He's like, uh, I, and, and he could tell I was like, sort of like, you know, taking a bag. I'm like, oh, what? And he was like, no, no, it's really great because it's way better. Like, we only watch American shows. <laughs> 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 and then he's like, but everything you do has to be entertaining. Like, your whole life is about movies, music, uh, sports, entertainment, like you, you revolve your life around the next entertaining thing. And then I thought about it and I was like, okay, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, and then I was, then I was like, what do you revolve your life around? And he's like, you know, like food and you know, it was, it was just, and he was in a tech, he's a tech guy, global tech person that chose to live in America. Cause, uh, 
things in Israel weren't super great. And so he got here two months before the whole Hamas attack happened. Anyway, it was sort of wild. I, I love that perspective because I think when it comes to God, we want God to entertain us. Mm. We want more gifts. We want more things. We want more stuff. And I think that's the part that I think is is missing in our relationship mm-hmm. with him is we can get a focused on what's what in it us. for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, has there ever been a part of your mm-hmm. life where, and I think what's really cool about you, Katie, is uh, you came to, to faith at 20. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I don't know, I, I'm sure there is, but was there anything that you were like looking for God? Hey, I will, I, I don't want the intimacy with God. I want the whatever. Is, was there a part of your life that was like that? I'm not, I'm not trying to sound like, <clears throat> oh, I'm like holier than that. But I remember like the first couple of years yeah. of being a believer, I was like a sponge. And like, that's all I wanted was to learn about God, learn about the Bible. Like I didn't even want to date. That's not to say I didn't have a couple of crushes, but I didn't want <laughs> to. D- <laughs> the problem is you got both Holland and me here and we remember and who so you dated. You, I know, you know, so let's not go down that train. <laughs> um, let's stay on the path. So I, I just remember like wanting God that, and that's that. So that's, I think what's really beautiful about that, Katie, is that's the true response of worship. And I think there's some people who come to God with a, a felt need, financial, relational. And then once they get that, once they're like, if I come to God, it will fix the felt need and they focus on the felt need need Mm -hmm. and a felt need's not bad a felt need should drive you to a deeper spiritual need like for you like Mm -hmm. i think when you if we remember correctly remember um it was like relational for you you wanted a boyfriend or a husband or whatever Mm -hmm. and then it went from that to jesus and Mm -hmm. that became your overarching life desire that was my passion yeah it was and i would say it still is yeah and and so what about you holland like Has there ever been a part of your life where like, God, if you just got me this and then the, this didn't come through and then you had to settle for just God, has that, has that been a part of your, your walk with God at all? Yeah, I think, um, like as I reflect back on, I I was similar in that, you know, I came to faith at 19. So, um, similar age and life stage and, very similar also in the sense of just like, man, I was just soaking it all up. I mm-hmm. just want to learn. I want to learn about the Bible. I want to learn about God. What does it mean to follow Jesus? I was hungry for it. But I was also still kind of deeply entrenched in uh, a relationship that I was in or wanting a relation. Like right. before I came to Christ, my view on life was um, I want to, it goes back to some of the struggles I had with my family growing up. Um, my parents got divorced when I was in middle school. Uh, a lot of that, a, a lot of the struggles there had to do with um, finances and uh, my dad struggling with alcohol. And so there's some things that I was like, okay, when I'm an adult, I don't want to drink because I've seen the damage that it can do. Um, I want to have a stable job so that I don't struggle with finances with my family. I want to be, you know, I want to be in a, be a good husband, have a healthy home, like all good things. But like I came into Christianity um, having to totally reframe how I think about life, right? Uh, so I was, I, I was very desperate still to, like, I want to get married. I want to have a family. I want to have a, a good job and stuff. And, and yet um, uh, I was planning on being an engineer, so I was studying to be an engineer. Felt the Lord calling me toward ministry and church planting. Um, there's a lot of money in engineering. It's not a lot, of, <laughs> lot of money in church planting. Like, you're rolling in it now, huh? Right, right. You know, <laughs> felt the Lord calling me down a path that was like, this feels way less financially mm-hmm. secure. Mm-hmm. And so it, I, I don't, you know, and I, I chose to obey God, but I had to wrestle with that. Do I, you know, what is my treasure? Is my treasure God himself or is it the things that I'm hoping God will give to me? Yeah. Um, financial security, a healthy marriage and a family and stuff like that. And so, uh, yeah, had a, a relation, had relationships in college and shortly after college that, you know, um, having to come to terms with, okay, this is not a relationship that is going to lead to marriage, right? And that being like, oh man, I'm losing something that I mm. wanted so badly. So anyway, uh, definitely had to come to grips with the reality of choosing God over things that I had long desired, I guess. Yeah, no, that that's sense. good. I, I think I had the same. It's kind of fun hearing your guys' stories because I think mine was the same way. Uh, <clears throat> I think my big, I think... When people ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I go, rich. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, that was it. It was weird. Uh, and then once God captured my heart, I was like, only thing I want to do is do more of the sharing of the gospel to like to further and I the richness came with the time with God and and just experiencing his grace and so the, the same thing that happened to you and the same thing happened, happened to you happened to me and it was just a beautiful like intensity of wanting to worship more and more okay so I love that aspect can we talk about I, I'm going to do some Latin can we do some Latin let's do it uh, ordo salutis can you tell me what that means Order of salvation. Nice job. The, the, you know what? Even at I, the, I, I know I didn't go to DTS. He didn't, he didn't go. He Chris. went to a, a. He went to like you know, there's like real seminary and then there's like the minor leagues, and he still knows what order. <laughs> I'm teasing. That's so terrible. I don't mean that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about Ordo Salutis. Because I, I, as I was reading this text, and as I was, the thought of the thought of like the order of salvation came to mind. And I think this is because I do think this is a picture of salvation in many ways, but I do feel like there is a struggle mm-hmm. when we talk about the order of salvation. And I'd love to get Katie's uh, response to this because I think it, what it feels like sometimes it might not necessarily what it is theologically. And let me, let me sort of explain um, the way that I sort of always viewed this is that, you know, and I think a lot of people do this, you obey first then you get saved. But clearly that, like, I'm going to obey, I'm going to do what God tells me to do, and now I'm saved. But that's not how it works. And let's walk through what uh, the Ordo Salutis is, and then let's see if we can see it here uh, in this text, and I'm going to do my best to kind of... Yeah, so walk us through the Ordo Salutis that we sort of see. And I know there's w- a many different <laughs> views on this, but let's just take, let's just take uh, Holland's view because we like him and he's really reformed. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, so you want to talk about the full-on deal, not just like what you see in Exodus, but well, like... I want to see I want to see the full-on deal, and then okay. I want to see the Exodus pieces that we can pull out. Okay, yeah, I mean the thing that we were talking about yeah, earlier, yeah. Uh, yeah. it goes in uh, the the order of election, calling, regeneration, conversion, justification, adoption, sanctification, perseverance, yep. glorification. All right, there's a bunch of Asians uh, in there, and I think some of these, you know, some of these happen. Hard to say this one after the other, some of them simultaneous, but uh, in general, that's the order I think yeah, we see this in Scripture, is, wow. so, especially in New Testament. Yeah, before. so essentially, like, what happens when you're saved? Like, how does that, and this is where, it's, you know how we, and I know this is where Katie will roll her eyes, but we've talked about enough, that I think you can hang with me on this one, where we've talked about superlapsarianism versus infralapsarianism, and you've just, there it is. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's kind of what we're doing here, but God chooses you Mm -hmm. and that's election like he is chosen before the foundation of the earth universe all that if he is going to save you yeah all right so then there's the calling where he reaches out through god's word it could be you hearing the gospel Mm -hmm. where uh, he opens your eyes like yeah or or at least the, the call which is if you Are we not there yet? Not, not sort of. I'm trying sort to. Oh, okay. Next step. I'm like well, regeneration. But, yeah, but, but <laughs> the, the thing that's nice is that if, we, if if you could hear God's call, it's irresistible grace. So you're going to respond to Him. If He's right. calling for you, God gets what He wants. Uh, then the regeneration happens here, where your heart, you get a new heart. And this is the part that I always struggle with, to be honest with you. Is it regeneration first, or is it conversion first? So that, and I know this, this we've talked about this because yeah. it's, yeah, yeah. it's, I always kind of thought like I have to have the, the ability to believe first because regeneration sounds like action to me. It is action, but it's action on God's behalf to us. So, so he it's regener- God being born again. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, it's like how Jesus said, uh, uh, like those who have not been born again cannot even see the kingdom of God. Okay, so John he, three, right? He puts in your he puts in your heart, causes you. Or First Peter, he causes us to, to be, be born, born again. again, and um, then and you, from that place, yeah, you have faith. From that place of regeneration, our eyes are open. So you know uh, we're spiritually dead. Right. Regeneration means we go from being dead to alive. Our mm-hmm. eyes are opened. Our ears are opened. And from that place, we can see the beauty and the glory of Jesus. Um, we respond in faith. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you think about conversion is turning your life toward Jesus, right? right? Putting your faith in Jesus. How can a spiritually dead person they do can't. that, right? So you got to be regenerated first. Um, and then upon regeneration, 
right? Uh, you see Jesus for who he is, a loving Savior, merciful, forgiving, and you are drawn to turn your life toward him. So. I, I've always sort of seen this, in, in my view, is as two sides of the same coin. You're like, what happens first? Or does it happen... But I, to your point, regeneration is he makes you born again. Then you're like, oh, I believe. And so, yeah, I would see like repentance and faith being very thing. similar as like, you know, two sides of the same coin. So of the like, regeneration is him saying, hey, you're born again. And then the next step is I now have the ability to believe. I have now the ability to re- repent. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's my stance. On I, it. I, and I, I think I agree with you. All right. So, whoa, last time we debated this, I you didn't know, agree I know. With I, I, like, I, maybe I was thinking you were defining regeneration differently. So I think <laughs> we, we might be on the same page here. So it's not quite as exciting. That's big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> when you look at this story here, uh-huh. the regeneration part is in, in, Exodus 19, verse 4. How I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So he re- he makes you born again. He regenerates you. He takes you to himself, and you don't really have a part in that other than right, receiving right. it. Exactly. So, But there is a piece in here that there is, and this is where it, they, took, they, under, they took shelter under the blood of the lamb. And what's and this, again, this is where it's, it's a big picture. And so... Um, they, what did they do? They they did something. They did put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, not maybe fully understanding the wrath of God that was coming that it would be saved from. But it was the it was God's choosing. He elected them. He calls out to them to do this thing. They uh, are they then put the blood of the lamb up and then they're led out and that's how the nation is birthed. So regeneration. I I, I guess that's kind of how I'm viewing this. I, I would agree in an analogous way. Yeah, I, thank you, an I don't think it applies way. to their personal salvation because no. we know not all Israel was saved. Right, so. and where do we know that from? Um, from the Old Testament uh, narratives of people who were hardened in their hearts, from Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 that speaks about it, from the Gospels where Jesus identifies Israelite uh, leaders especially who had hardened their hearts, were whitewashed tombs, yep. root of vipers, those, right. kind of, those kind of things. So and, who are part of Israel outwardly and yet rejected Jesus. And I like not all, Romans 9, 6, but it is yeah. not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Right. And not all children of Abraham, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. It's, it's essentially, like there are people in Israel, and we know this from the mixed multitude that leaves Egypt, that there were Egyptians involved in there, people, maybe syncretists, people that bring in their own things, and uh, they're the ones that kind of cause a lot of rebellion. They're the ones that's like, hey, what about a golden calf? Or at least I assume that. Of course, Aaron's the one that makes it. So there's a lot of issues that, that come in there. So I, I think you're right. It's, it's in an analogous, maybe a picture way, but not in a personal yeah. salvation way. A foreshadowing yes. uh, of salvation, showing, showing a picture. I think some principles are true there. One, God initiates the salvation, yes. right? right? God chose them. He rescued them. He calls them to obedience. Right. Um, so I think there's principles that are true there, but uh, I don't think you can say that uh, they were all personally regenerated when no. God brought them out of Egypt. Because, Clearly, and, yeah. and the reason why they weren't all personally regenerated. So they regenerated. were just doing what they were told, but weren't like... Yeah, because so the picture, and this is the part where I'd love to you know, jump in here, Holland. The nation of Israel is a picture of a personal salvation, so to speak. Right. So you're born again. The nation was born out of Egypt from an old slave master to God as your ultimate benevolent dictator or master. So mm-hmm. it's not like you're free. Now. I'm free. I can be my own whatever. I'm my own God. No, it's I, I shift masters from a slave to a bondage of slavery to now a, I'm now a slave to righteousness and God, which is ultimately he has designed me for benefit and through worship of him. So is it all like ultimately not all of the people that made it to the promised land are believers right this is where salvation has always been by grace through faith if they believed in the promises of god then they were saved in the Mm -hmm. same way that we are saved there's a distinct difference though in the salvation of um the old testament is that they didn't have the the power of the holy spirit right there was now i was it just in god seeing their hearts Man, now we're going to get into uh, What do you think on that one? It's seeing their hearts, um, sort of. It, God's still, remember with Rahab, I always look at Rahab versus Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. So 
the same revelation, in a sense, was given to Pharaoh as was to Rahab. The fear of the Lord kind of came out. Pharaoh, who was definitely not chosen by God, rejected. Rahab, who was chosen by God in Jericho, uh, received salvation, and she takes on, um, she becomes a part of Israel and Mm -hmm. is totally saved and is in the line of Jesus, which is just wild to think about all that. So I do think there is, God's calling goes out, and you can't respond to God unless he reveals himself to you. So somehow God made himself... um, be seen by Rahab, not seen by Pharaoh. And I think that, I don't, what's, that's the mystery here, which is what Paul always refers to, is like the how people are exactly saved. It's, it's, I think that's part of the mystery of it. But ultimately, it's faith in what Jesus does on the cross and, and that he dies on the cross and he's raised from the dead. Yeah. God just had a different process of saving people in the Old Testament. And that, well, I but think like the, it, main, the main difference Old Testament to New Testament is Old Testament was looking forward to right. the promised Messiah. Mm-hmm. New Testament is looking at or back to yeah. Jesus. And so even in the Old Testament, he was still saved by grace through faith. Um, and that faith was in God's promise to one day you know, redeem the world through a Messiah. Uh, in as sem- promised back in Genesis 3. So. Right. In seminary, I think that, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. In seminary, I think we said the Old Testament. It's just hard to like explain. Like it's like I, I can understand the big picture mentally, but if I was asked to like explain how people were saved yeah, in there, the Old Testament, I wouldn't know. How so you saved. remember I, I mentioned this forever ago, but Genesis three about the proto evangelion, which is where, <laughs> which is what where was that one more time proto evangelion, uh, <laughs> where Jesus is mentioned in Genesis three when when Eve the um, when Eve is cursed mm-hmm. uh, and Satan the serpent is cursed. You know there will be war, enmity between the woman and her and her offspring and the serpent, but the the serpent will strike his heel, but he will crush his head, and um and so that was sort of a wild thing to have a the woman see, which is sort of wild to think about, mm-hmm. which. The word there is sperma, which is sort of wild when you think about that, that the woman's seed would crush the head of the, s- the snake. Hmm. So just a lot to yeah. think about there. Anyway. And that was Jesus. That was, yeah, that was you. where that, you yeah, <laughs> Thank you. And that was Jesus, right? And so from Genesis 3 forward, you still see that. And so then the promise of Abraham uh, that he, he would become a nation, that's in uh, Genesis uh, 12, Genesis 15, specifically with uh, Abrahamic covenant. And then you see it lived out with the 400 years of affliction prophesied by God to Abraham in Genesis 15 is lived out by the Israelites, and then eventually Moses comes and delivers them. The Mm -hmm. promise is still for them to have a Messiah uh, that is going to deliver them ultimately, But which is why it's weird with um, when we get into the New Testament how they're still waiting for the Messiah, but they just couldn't recognize him when he came. Right. The, uh, and like I said, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, which is, you know, nerdy talk. Yeah. It's like ultimately just trust God's sovereignty and it doesn't really matter. Right. Okay. There, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. If, if someone, you said you wouldn't know how to answer. If someone asked you, how are people saved in the Old Testament? You say, by faith in God. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question that came up. And this promised Messiah. Jesus. Who they didn't know who it was yet. Right. The promise right. was still clear. The whole tension of the Old Testament is... Who's the Messiah going to be? You know, is it going to, yeah. when, when's it going to come? You know, is it, is it David? Is he the promised Messiah? He crushes Goliath, right? Goliath, uh, his armor is described as serpent armor, bronze armor, very similar to the word for like a serpent. Yep. And uh-huh. David crushes his head. And so it's like, oh man, is he the Messiah, the one who's promised to crush the head of the serpent? And then David falls into sin and it's like, nope, wasn't him. And so who's it going to be? Is it going to be his son, Solomon? Is it going to be so on and so forth? Uh, and you keep getting, uh, People who step up um, as leaders, uh, who experience God's calling and blessing, but then ultimately fall and uh, fall short, and show that they're not the Messiah. But God keeps reconfirming His covenant and His mm-hmm. promise. Right. One day, a Messiah will come. He'll be from the line of David. He'll be from you know the tribe of Judah. He'll be a descendant of Abraham. And so, when you finally get to the New Testament and you see the genealogy there, the significance is like, hey, this is the one. He's yeah. he's finally here. It's Jesus. Yeah, it's so good. Um, the, one of the questions we got, because we, we mentioned Mount Zion, which is the heavenly kingdom versus Mount Sinai, which is really, I guess, a mountain of penalty. Anyone who touch it will die. But you've come to a better or different mountain because you now have the Holy Spirit. You're now going to be made in righteousness. And so the question was, 
because uh, I, I went to Hebrews 12 in, in the message uh, specifically. You have come to Mount Zion to the, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels and festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God. So the question is, I'm not really sure exactly what is a Zionist, but it seems like it is often a term meant to apply to the Jewish or Christian community. After today's sermon, I think that is referring to our future home in Mount Zion, a.k.a. heaven. Is that right? What do you think? About Zion or Zionism? Let's go with Zion first, and then we'll go to (laughs) Zionism. Yeah, I mean, I I think they're right in identifying Zion as uh, referring to our future home. It's also like the prophetic uh, or poetic name for Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You see in the Old Testament Mm -hmm. prophecies about what Jerusalem was meant to be and what it will be in the new creation, the new Jerusalem the home of God's people. Um, but yeah, Zionism is a different thing. Different thing. But, but on Zion real quick, I love Psalm 87. The love, the love, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than any other dwelling place. He likes to be a doorkeeper and he likes to invite, the Lord records, he registers the people. This one was born in her. In other words, he lists off all these people that are born in Ethiopia, Babylon, Egypt. He said, no, but they, this one is born in Zion. It means you're born again. And so I love that Zion view of heaven. Now, Let's go to Zionism, which is where we hear this a lot. Uh, It's more of a movement um, to reestablish and protect the Jewish nation, which is now Israel. It was established as a political organization in 1897 by Theodore Herzl. And so I think that's what when you hear Zionist or Zionism, it's to establish uh, a Jewish Hebrew community on earth uh, because that's where ultimately it should be. Now, the weird thing is Zion will be on earth if you believe in the millennial kingdom. Right? Where are you at in the millennial kingdom? you down with millennial kingdom? Do we have time for that? <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we probably need to wrap up. But essentially, there's two views on it. Maybe that's more of a heaven on earth kind of a thing. And this is a Jewish community or a those specifically that are kind of reestablishing a Jewish hold on earth, a specific location of land and blessing that would be on earth. Would that be... And- well, it used pejoratively, too, to refer to people who are, like, anti-Palestine yeah. or something. And so it's used as a, a way of Negative calling someone. Negative connotation. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense to you? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate all of you being here uh, for the sermon recap. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah, and Katie, always love having you. And listen, thanks for watching. If you have any more questions, make sure you text us seven three seven two three one zero six zero five. We would love to hear from you. Uh, remember, make sure you share, like, subscribe, do all the things on all your favorite platforms, and let your friends know to watch and listen to the Pastor Plex podcast. From our house to yours, have an awesome week of worship.